so good to see such a full house. I want to begin by acknowledging that the land we gather on today, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the university's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Today is the International Day of Climate Action, a fact that may have gotten overshadowed by a lot of news happening right now. But I can't think of a better person to speak to the subject of human values on this day than David Wallace Wells, author of The Uninhabitable Earth, an instant New York Times bestseller. It was named one of the New Yorker's favorite books of 2019 and one of Time's 100 must-read books of that year. Wallace Wells is a com columnist and staff writer at the New York Times and was previously the deputy editor at New York Magazine. Please join me in welcoming David Wallace Wells. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction, Jeremy. Thanks for the introduction, Hollis. It's really great to be here at the University of Utah, at the Tanner Humanities Center, and especially great to be delivering um, this lecture, the Tanner Lecture. I'm, I'm honored and, and humbled to be here, um, to be talking to you, all of you, about the warming world and how we might live on it. Not just about the disruptions of warming, but about what it might mean to orient our understanding of the climate future less around the bleak news from the climate apocalypse, or for that matter, the good news from the energy transition than around uncertainty. And that theme, climate uncertainty, is going to be the theme of this talk. Since in many ways, I think even as we have begun after decades of warnings to finally step into a climate future, to see the climate impacts in a sort of daily or weekly way, um, and also to see the global project of decarbonization starting in earnest, even though we're finally doing that, or maybe because we are finally doing that, we are nevertheless flying pretty blind. Um, but I wanna start with a story that has nothing to do with climate change or the uncertainties of a warmer future. The story is about January 2021, as the US was in the midst of the first winter wave of COVID infections. Um, we had spent much of the past year watching these curves, or I had, <laughs> watching these curves of cases and hospitalizations and deaths um, with a certain amount of sort of superstitious trepidation, waiting for those waves to break, um, waiting for the crises to pass. Um, we knew by that point, by the January of 2021, that waves were the way that this pandemic was spreading. So that winter wave in, in, in January of 2021 was the worst the country had seen. Three or 4,000 Americans were dying every day, as the Biden administration now often likes to remind us. Um, but it, we nevertheless could be forgiven at the time for thinking, how much worse could it get? How, how long would it go? How many people would die in this wave? How many people would die overall? Um, and maybe even most dramatically, how many would, would die in, the, in those last few weeks before a mass vaccination rollout, which is the situation we were dealing with then in January of 2021. Now, as it happens, the CDC maintained a bundle of forecasts throughout the first few years of the pandemic, um, 26 of what they considered the best pedigreed, most reliable projections for the way that the pandemic would spread through the population over the following two or three weeks. And you could look at these projections at any time and see what all of these different groups, 26 different models, said the next couple of weeks were going to be like. On January 18th, 2021, you could look at those 26 different projections and have 26 answers about where the country would be two weeks from then. And although that doesn't sound like a very long time, I think it's a reminder that even then, even almost a full year into the pandemic, we still thought that knowledge about what would happen in two or three weeks out, it almost felt like special wisdom the best we could do. So two weeks came and went. As it happens, it was a period of rapid decline in transmission, which is probably what most people who know respiratory diseases would have told us to expect because that's what happens at the end of January every year with all respiratory diseases. But the models hadn't predicted a decline. Not at all. In 
24 of the 26 models, the actual outcome, where we landed on February 1st, was not within what was called the 95% confidence interval that had been modeled just two weeks before. The other two models gave it barely a sliver of a chance. So all told, the absolute best gold standard estimates for what the pandemic was going to look like just two weeks out, none of them projected anything like what we saw two weeks later, and barely any of them even included as a possibility what came to pass as reality, again, just two weeks later. Now, I was kind of outraged by this. I felt sort of betrayed by the modelers. I called up my brother to sort of vent about it. Um, <laughs> I talked about how poorly our leaders seem to understand the nature of pandemic spread and how much we still seem to be operating in ignorance almost a year into the pandemic and how distressing it was that whatever we told ourselves about the triumph of modernity and the conquest of the natural world we seemed still really to be flailing around like humans in much earlier eras confronting a pandemic threat. And then there was a break in the conversation and he said to me, Dave, there's something I, I don't, I've never really been able to figure out. Why do you care so much about the models? <laughs> He's like, either the people are gonna get sick or they're not. Either the people are gonna die or they're not. Why does it matter whether it was predicted or not? When I relayed this story a few weeks ago to Hollis on Zoom, she gave me a look that I, inter I may be projecting, but I interpreted to me in, um, well, that's a question with an obvious answer, why you should care about the models. And there are, there are some obvious answers. Um, you know, there are com concrete planning needs during a pandemic. We need to allocate resources. We no need to know how to advise people, how to protect themselves. But there were also a lot of less concrete needs, which I felt myself kind of keenly. Like many people, I spent the year, first year of the pandemic on a kind of a roller coaster. And I wanted to know what to expect, I think, because it gave me a sense of control, however delusional, about the world that we were heading into. <laughs> now, everybody probably has heard the dictum that all models are wrong and some models are useful. Um, and there's a whole quasi-epistemological discourse about how we should think about this entire practice of modeling the future. Personally, I think it's, it's revealing that a lot of researchers sometimes use the phrase toy model when they're talking about putting something together quickly. Um, and I'm also very interested sort of separately in the way that artificial intelligence may change our conceptual framework for modeling because if we now build models based on inputs that we choose to include in our algorithms, we're moving towards a world in which we're going to have maps of what to expect that are not legible to us and not reducible to those inputs. And that's a very, very different world that we're going to be living in, I think, quite soon. But the question of how we model the future is not just an epistemological matter or a quantitative question or something for policy debates. It has a kind of a spiritual dimension too. What does the future look like? And how do we relate to it? How do the stories we tell about that future shape our understanding of it when we finally encounter it? And how do they shape our understanding of the present? Perhaps by darkening it, by extending a sort of continuity towards a scarier future, or perhaps by lightening it, by suggesting a contrast between the world that we're living in today and the world that we're expecting to live in in the future. These questions had a sort of deeper and more personal relevance for me too, as someone who spent an awful lot of time looking at climate projections and trying to piece together a vision of the world we might be navigating on the other side of warming. I didn't feel comfortable just taking things day by day like my brother suggested in the pandemic or for that matter with climate. I'd spent the last few years immersed in that climate science because I thought for all the limitations of um, those projections, they nevertheless offered the best guide we had to an otherwise dizzying and disorienting and in many ways overwhelming future. So what, what did those guideposts say? What did that future look like? Today, the world's warmed by about 1.3 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial average. And that probably doesn't sound like very much, just one, one degree, 1 1.3 degrees. It actually today places us entirely outside the window of temperatures that enclose all of human history, which means that everything that we have ever known as a species, from the development of agriculture to the rise of the modern nation state, technology, culture, all of it is to some degree the result of climate conditions which we have already 
left behind. It's like we've landed on a new planet with a new climate. And we have to figure out what of the civilization that we've brought with us to this point can survive those new conditions, what will have to be reformed and renovated, what will have to be discarded and mourned. There are a lot of ways of thinking of this set of challenges, you know, how different is the world already today, putting aside the question of future warming, from the one that every other human that has ever walked the earth has known. But the way that I think of it most often has to do with the city of Houston and their experience of being hit by five 500 year storms in five years. Now, as you can tell by that statement, if you hadn't thought about it before, the term 500 year storm is not all that meaningful anymore. And it never had all that hard a scientific basis either, but it's a reminder at a vernacular level of just what a different set of climate conditions we are living in today than everything we have ever known to build expectations upon in the future. 500 year storm implies a storm that we would expect to hit once every 500 years. Now, 500 years ago, there were no North Americans living in, there were no Europeans living in North America. Hernando Cortez had recently landed in Mexico. We're talking about a storm that we'd expect to hit once during that entire history. The arrival of Europeans in, in North America, the waging of a genocide against the native people, the building of colonies, the fighting of a revolution, the building of a slave empire, the fighting of a civil war, industrialization, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War and the age of the American empire, the end of the Cold War, the end of history, September 11th, the financial crisis, COVID-19, one storm in all that time. And Houston's been hit by five of them in five years. It's literally millennia of extreme weather compressed into the space of half a decade. Now, Houston's still standing, mostly. And I think that's important to remember, too, in the same way that after an absolutely off-the-charts fire season in Canada, most of Canada's standing, too. Most people living in Europe lived through the incredible heat waves of the past summer. Most people um, in living in South America have lived through the off-the-charts winter heat they've had recently and the wildfires they've had down there, too, which is altogether a kind of reminder as devastating as many of these disasters and anomalies really are, that climate change is not the whole of our destiny, merely the natural landscape on which we will build our future. But that landscape is uncharted territory. The heating of the planet is an experiment that we are running only once, and it's thrown almost everything that we've ever taken for granted about the environmental basis of our lives into a kind of a disarray. And that is really where I wanna to focus today. For the past few years, especially climate discourse has sort of alternated between apocalypticism and can-do triumphalism, between bursts of optimism and bursts of pessimism. And the question of how to calibrate our, you know, those two sets of facts or two sets of feelings, maybe the thing that I'm personally asked most about when asked about climate. But of course, Climate change isn't really a matter of mood affiliation. <laughs> and while there are reasons for optimism and reasons for pessimism at the moment, the thing that strikes me most as we get bad news from the climate system and good news from the energy transition is that the overall picture is much messier than it might have seemed when we were just drawing hypothetical curves and whiteboarding our future from the present. It's better to have a messier, future of the, messier, messier picture of the future than a simplistically bleak one of course, but it's also more uncertain, and that's kind of where we are. For much of the last five years, I, I clung to projections about where we were headed as the only guide that we had to experiment in that future. It used to be that I would look at a chart of emissions in which emissions would grow and grow and grow every year, and then a chart, the same chart would break into projections for the future. We could do this, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And I would think that that future depended on which of those pathways we chose. But as we start tiptoeing into that future, I find myself thinking now, we're not walking down any of those paths exactly. None of them are a great guide to the world that we're living in today or the one that we're heading for. And these days I look at the same chart and I want to wipe away all of those projections and just focus on where we are, which is at a peak, and how far we are from net zero, which is very far. 
And that's probably a point that could have been better made if I had a slide here where I had these things when I wiped it up. But in part to make this point about uncertainty, I'm, I'm trying to do this um, speech today without slides. Um, because I think that a lot of those charts and graphs really do give us a false sense of, of certainty about where we're heading. And even if, it's, if it runs the risk of confusing you a little bit, throwing data at you that you can't necessarily process, I actually think that might be a psychologically, intellectually productive way of thinking about these challenges. But I hope you don't take me to mean that we know nothing about the climate future. Um, we do know a lot. We know, frankly, an awful lot, um, especially given how recently the science has started to develop and um, how, how crude it was even just a few decades ago. So we know the planet's climate is warming. We know that it's happening at a faster rate than it has ever happened before on this planet. It's a period, um, and the history of the planet is a period of time that includes five mass extinctions, four of which um, have to do with climate change powered by the changes in greenhouse gases. In fact, we know that pace of warming is at least 10 times faster than any of those extinction events, perhaps 100 times faster. And we now know, um, this is a finding that's been sort of solidified just over the past couple of weeks, that the rate is actually accelerating. Um, according to one of the godfathers of climate science, James Hansen, um, the rate may actually be doubling at the moment, the rate of warming. That's not settled. The acceleration is settled. The doubling is, is more of a speculative. We've been extremely good at predicting global average temperature rise so far. Looking back three or four or five or eight decades, all of the charts that were like, if, if CO2 goes to here, we'll be here with temperature have been proven incredibly prescient, even uncanny. And we also know that we've done this damage, all of it, quite recently. You may think of global warming as a story of centuries. You know, our great grandparents started burning coal in England or whatever. And we're going to have to clean up the mess so that our great-grandchildren don't have to deal with the consequences. But half of all of the damage that we've done to the planet's climate through the burning of fossil fuel has come in the last 25 years. And that's since Al Gore published his first book on warming. It's since Jim Hansen first testified before the Senate. It's since the premiere of Friends. It's since the establishment of the UN's IPCC body <sighs> Um, which broadcast unmistakably to the world that this was a real problem which we had to really worry about. We've done more damage since then than we've done in all the decades, indeed the centuries, indeed the millennia that came before. We've done more damage knowingly than we ever managed in ignorance. A quarter of the damage has come since 2008 when Joe Biden was elected vice president on a ticket headlined by Barack Obama who accepted the Democratic nomination and announced that that would be the moment that we look back on when the rising of the seas began to slow and the planet began to heal. A quarter of the damage has been done since that moment. And though we think of carbon dioxide as a gas which dissipates, we actually know that that's not how it works. <laughs> Once in the atmosphere, it hangs there, um, typically for centuries, if not millennia, making it effectively permanent, which has some interesting impacts on the way that we think about time and historical responsibility, since the burning of a piece of coal today in China is doing equivalent damage to the burning of a piece of coal in Newcastle in the 19th century or Pittsburgh in the 20th century. And that means that while we often conceptualize the climate challenge by thinking about the future and what must be done, we all should also think about our history and what we've already done. And by that measure, by the way, the US is by far the world's worst emitter and will never be caught by China or anyone else. We also know the scale of that damage that's been done. Literally, we can measure it by weight. And all that stuff that's hanging permanently in the atmosphere weighs more than everything that humans have ever built on the surface of the Earth. It also weighs more than every living thing on planet Earth. So in this way, we've built a larger and more permanent monument to human civilization in the atmosphere than we ever managed on the planet itself. And we have reshaped that atmosphere more through the burning of fossil fuels than this planet has been reshaped by life. That is, as what, that, that is the scale of the damage that we've done. We also know what we need to do, which is to say decarbonize everything. Not just our power sector, not just our cars, but our airplanes, also our in heavy industry, um, our agriculture, our infrastructure. Absolutely every feature of modern life has a large carbon footprint. And if we want to stop warming, it means eliminating all of that carbon. This has recently been called a World War II scale mobilization. 
and more recently, um, a green industrial revolution. It is that, but I also think it's important to remember that it's also a kind of deindustrialization because electricity is much more efficient than the burning of fossil fuel. Simply electrifying our power systems would mean that we would need only half as much energy as we, have, as we use today, maybe less. Land, land use for all global renewables um, is smaller than is currently used by the world's oil and gas infrastructure, which means that making that trade would actually require less land rather than more. And while there's been a lot of talk recently about the mining needs to produce um, a renewable revolution, mining sufficiently to totally power all of the world's energy needs indefinitely into the future would only be one one hundredth as land intensive as today's extraction of oil and gas. So if we go from dirty energy to clean, we actually cut our mining footprint by a factor of 100. And while it's a subject for another lecture, I do think that more people should keep these facts in mind when we debate degrowth, because part of what we're doing, even in a green growth scenario, is essentially downsizing our footprint on the planet. There are also some things we're pretty confident about when it comes to impacts. I mentioned earlier, we're currently at about 1.3 degrees of warming, and at two degrees, which is, we might do a little better than that, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that we get up to two degrees or above. Two degrees, we would expect that just from the pollution produced from the burning fossil fuels to get us to that level, we would expect 153 million additional lives lost due to air pollution, 153 million. We would expect that flooding events that used to hit once a century would come every single year in many parts of the world, more than once a year. These are flooding events that used to shape whole civilizations, which were recorded in mythology and remembered as out of history events. We are now expecting them, again, at just two degrees, um, almost everywhere in the world, every single year. And the heat stress is so, will be so intense, again, at just two degrees, that across whole parts of South Asia and the Middle East, It'll be so hot during summer that it'll be a meaningful risk to one's health to even go outside for a few hours, certainly a risk of heat stroke to work outside for a few hours. And according to some studies, um, for many vulnerable people, going outside during those stretches of the year would be sufficient to kill them from the effects of heat. So we know a lot, really. We, we know quite a lot about this experiment that we're only getting a chance to run once. But it's one thing to consider these models and projections from the vantage of a relatively stable climate and imagine a future of instability. And it's another to begin living in that unstable climate, as we really have over the last few years, and start to see just how much still surprises us and how much we're still learning about the climate impacts themselves and probably more importantly, how they interface with us, with humans. So take heat, for instance. I mentioned just a minute ago, according to some very you know blue ribbon top of the field kind of studies, it's expected that north of two degrees, we're talking about unlivable heat stress affecting billions of people for stretches of weeks at a time. But that may be a misleading projection. Um, and in fact, the main author of those papers has told me, he thinks that we're gonna do much better than that. Um, I've seen it myself in my own research and writing Last year, in early spring, there was an unprecedented heat wave that swept South Asia and the Middle East, in particular across India and Pakistan. And when scientists talk about mortality risk from heat, they talk about what's called a wet bulb temperature, which is a mix of heat and humidity. So if it's really hot, it can be pretty dry and you're pretty safe. And if it's wet, it can, doesn't have to be that hot for it to be really risky to your health. And studies have shown that um, there's a kind of what they call a maximum survivable limit of wet bulb temperature. And if it gets to that point, people simply won't be able to cool off, especially if they're being active, even if they're young and healthy. During this heat wave in India and Pakistan, there were a number of places where the maximum survivable wet bulb temperature was reached or quite closely approached. Only for a few hours, but nevertheless, right there. Some of them were cities of hundreds of thousands of people, other places more rural areas. But across India and Pakistan, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people subjected to heat quite close to some of these limits. And people did die, but not 100 million people, not 500,000 people, probably not even 100,000 people. The data is a little complicated. India doesn't do great in measuring deaths there, and we should almost certainly you know, adjust our estimates significantly upward from their official tallies. But in fact, more people died this summer in Europe, 60,000 from heat, than died last spring in India, even though the, the temperature 
the wet bulb temperature was so much higher there. And in fact, that's been the pattern over the past generation, that the deadliest heat events are not in the global south, are not in developing countries, are not in the hottest parts of the world, in part because in those parts of the world, people's bodies are used to higher temperatures. They're, they know how to adapt because they're comfortable with, if not the extremes that we're seeing now, then something close to them. Um, and they've adopted cultural and economic um, political practices to allow them to survive under what would be intolerable conditions for most of the rest of the world. The deadliest heat event, events have all been in the global north, in places where people were not used to heat at all. Many of them don't have air conditioning. They have buildings that were built to retain heat rather than distribute it and cool it. Um, and I think this is a very powerful case study and lesson into the complexities and nuances of these climate threats. We can you know, paint a map red with heat risk, um, but ultimately all of us are going to be navigating that landscape of risk as humans, as individuals, as political actors, through societies, through communities, through built environments. And all of these make the actual outcomes much, much harder to see, much harder to see clearly. So, I mean, I think that heat is gonna be a real problem for South Asia. I don't wanna dis dismiss, dismiss or diminish that. Um, but I also don't think it's safe to say, as many people have unfortunately over the last few decades, oh, it's the equatorial bands of the planet that are gonna really get screwed here. Everybody else is gonna be fine. We have a lot of work to do, even in the richest parts of the world, to protect our most vulnerable people. Or think of the, the fires that swept across Canada this, this summer. They tripled the previous record for area burn six times as much land burned as in the recent average, and 70 times as much as in a recent calm year. Half of the world's countries can fit inside the area that was burned inside of Canada this year. And if you take two thirds of the world's countries, take all of their carbon footprints and add them up, they add up to less than the carbon released by the fires in Canada this year. So Canada's carbon emissions are greater than 160 countries. Total, not individual, total. Many climate scientists have told me they don't even know how to incorporate the season into their historical averages because it's such an outlier that it distorts the trend line so much they may want to just leave it out. That's how much of a surprise this year has been. And there are similar questions all around climate science because of what's, sorry, similar questions all around climate science because of what's um, known as rapid attribution. We can now do things like confidently say that the heat wave that hit the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia a couple summers ago was a one in a thousand year event in today's climate. But it also did happen. <laughs> so one in a thousand year event did actually happen and it killed a few thousand people. That heat wave that swept across Europe last summer and killed 60,000 was actually a much less unlikely event than the one that hit the Pacific Northwest and killed a few thousand. So it's not just the extremes and the anomalies that are damaging here. When it comes to human impacts, climate variability is not the only driver. The same heat wave hitting later in the summer is safer because people's bodies have had a time to adjust over the course of the summer. Um, it's better if you have air conditioning than if you don't. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the building materials matter. Um, whether you're in a city or outside a city matters too because cities retain heat somewhat dramatically. There can be 10 degrees warmer than it would be without the, all the asphalt. There are also big questions about how to think about these um, sort of pure matters of climate science. There's like how it interfaces with our built environment and our societies, but it's also just the things we know and how we contextualize the climate events themselves. How do we make sense of data that tells us that sea ice anomalies, for instance, are a one in five sigma or six sigma or seven sigma event? What does it mean if we're witnessing a once in a billion year event on this planet? Statistical analysis here fails us almost as surely as language does. Even if the anomaly qualifies as only a one in a million, what does it mean to be living in a one in a million planet? And where does the branching of chance go from there? How do we plan around those things? As I hope these examples show, there are uncertainties at almost every level. There are uncertainties about the climate system. One recent debate is about what's called climate sensitivity. So if we double CO2, how much warming do we get? Conventional analysis suggests three degrees, but the uncertainty range includes warming up to four and a half degrees. So even if we do quite a good job at decarbonizing, we could get unlucky on that front and end up on a warmer planet. We have uncertainties about the human response in terms of mitigation. Even simply assessing current policies, um, we have some assessments from places like the International Energy Agency, which suggests that 
we are almost on track for net zero by 2050. And others like the American Energy Information Agency, which say that fossil fuel emissions won't even decline at all by 2050. And both of those are thoughtfully built models. Personally, I'm more on the IEA side than the American EIA side, but, so I think we're gonna do better rather than worse, but you know, these are not things that we know for sure. We also have uncertainties about adaptation, a lot of them, which I think this is a, a, a big part of the story to emerge is that adaptation will be as large uh, a contributor and a factor in, in our futures than um, as, as the climate impacts themselves. It's tempting to think that motivated in part by knowledge and in part by fear, we can take action to protect one another. But across the world, people are moving toward the risk of flooding, not away from it. Or look at Lahaina in Maui, where a complex stew of factors created what is the deadliest American wildfire in a full century. And only the latest example of what some climate scientists describe as the return of the urban firestorm, which is to say fires that, wildfires that are not proceeding tree to tree, but house to house, in part because of how those houses were built, how the housing zoning was developed, how the housing codes were developed, which is to say it is making our development choices the fuel. And this was, until recently, almost unheard of. I mean, we talked about the Great Chicago Fire, we talked about the Great London Fire, those were in different eras. When a small town in northern Canada called Slave Lake burned in 2011, it felt like it was a new era. Then a much bigger town, Fort McMurray, burned in 2016, and it was, oh, we've seen another example of this. And it was a, a big industrial city. It wasn't just a tiny little hamlet in the woods. But even then, people didn't really think of it as um, something we were going to be seeing nearly as regularly as we have. It's happened since in Santa Rosa and in Paradise, California. It's happened in Boulder and Lytton in, in British Columbia and Enterprise in Canada, to name just a few. In Kelowna, in British, Col in, uh, British Columbia this year, wildfires jumped two miles across Lake Okanagan. The embers were the size of fists, and they were giving off so much heat that they were picked up by NASA satellites. You just to think about what kind of protection is necessary to protect yourself from a wildfire if a two-mile lake is insufficient. We've got some thinking to do about the way that we plan our, um, our development, for sure. We have uncertainties also about normalization, which I think of as the flip side of um, adaptation, but is also a kind of adaptation, a perverse kind of adaptation, the way we accommodate ourselves to a more brutal world. Think about how quickly that line of fire passed from the, from the headlines, or how even more quickly we forgot about the flood event in Libya when a totally unprecedented rain storm, a medicane, I think it was a, judged to be a one in 500 year event, hit um, a dam that was really poorly maintained and had been left to, in disrepair and created the deadliest flooding event anywhere in the world this century. This is not something that we're talking about every day as a major global event. It just happened six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. So this upshot of all of this is that the climate future that we're already entering into is one that we can only see kind of dimly. Now, in some big and important ways, even so, we've resolved large uncertainties about climate in recent years. That's the job of science, of course, to attack these uncertainties and give us an even clearer picture. And I don't wanna cast shade on that work, but to emphasize the way in which a close reading of science really suggests that we should be thinking perhaps less about their median projections, and more about how large their uncertainty ranges are that they put around each of these. But even so, I want to tell you one story about median projections, in part um, to give me like some good news to end on. Um, and that's about global average temperatures, which is the sort of umbrella measure under which all projections of particular climate impacts fall. Five years ago, we thought there was time to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial average. That's the ambitious goal of the, climate, of the Paris Climate Accords. And we also thought that what was then called business as usual emissions would lead to four or five degrees of warming. That was about our range. 1.5 C on the optimistic end, 5 C on the do nothing end. Today, we've lost the chance at 1.5 C. The global carbon budget for that level of warming is less than two years of current emissions. But the high end estimate has fallen perhaps even more dramatically. Thanks to a whole host of factors, climate mobilization, 
global activism, the incredible drop in the price of renewable energy, the commitment of political actors the world over, the cultural change of people demanding action, the end of climate denial in any position of power. Conventional wisdom now holds that our expected warming is somewhere in the two degrees to three degree range, a much narrower range, which means that a business as usual future now has only about half as much warming in it as we had just five years ago. Now those claims, as I say, are shadowed by uncertainty as there are a lot of assumptions that go into them, but they also mark, I think, some quite significant progress and ones that may well serve us to sort of anchor our expectations for the future. Um, but where does that leave us? Thinking about a future of two to three degrees as opposed to four or five. As I mentioned earlier, you know, for decades, visions of our climate future were kind of anchored by, on the one hand, Pollyanna-like faith that everything would be fine and normality would endure, and on the other, quasi-millenarian intuitions of an ecological end of days, during which perhaps billions of lives would be devastated or destroyed. Neither of those futures looks all that likely now, with the most terrifying predictions made unlikely by decarbonization and the hopeful ones practically foreclosed by tragic delay. The window of possible climate futures is almost certainly narrowing, and as a result, we're getting a clearer sense of what's to come. A new world full of disruption, but also billions of people, well past climate normal, and yet mercifully short of climate apocalypse. And though that window is narrowing, it doesn't eliminate uncertainty because what it remains is human uncertainty. How we handle that future, how we design for it, and how we try to navigate it. In narrowing our range of expected futures, to some extent we've traded one set of uncertainties about global average temperature rise for another about politics and human feedbacks. And in thinking about how to navigate that future, that climate window, I wonder what would it mean to anchor our understanding, not in apocalypse or normality as we're so tended, as we're so likely to, but instead in uncertainty and humility. I don't know that we have a good answer because I don't think we're all that good on any front in thinking about the world in terms of those factors, uncertainty and humility. You know, scientists will often talk about the precautionary principle, but we're terrible at that and perhaps getting worse. You know, over the course of the pandemic, the phrase has almost become a little bit of a joke and most indications suggest that if we were hit with the same threat again next year, we'd probably do less to halt the spread of COVID-2 than we, or COVID-3, however you want to call it, than we did um, the first time around. With climate, as a world, we've used uncertainty much more as an excuse for inaction than as an argument for moving faster. But the intuitive alternative, a kind of wait and see approach, doesn't really work either. Not just because it leaves us unprepared, but because our capacity for normalization is so extreme that anything that just happened or is just around the corner seems pretty manageable, even if it seemed totally unimaginable and totally unacceptable a decade or two in the past. I think that's the lesson of those stories of Lahaina and Libya and the way that we've essentially turned them into background noise, um, even though they were disasters that should stand out from the historical record, should scream out from the historical record at us. Um, but I want to put aside the question of policy for a moment and think about the spiritual dimension of the question. You know, in general these days, I think we reduce too much to discussion of policy. And, um, you know, as though it only matters that like one and a half million Americans died if we have some implication for COVID policy, for instance. Um, and there are policy implications on climate. You know, do we need to protect against a 500 year storm surge or a thousand year storm surge or a million year storm surge? Do we plan for heat waves not seen since the 1930s or never before seen in human history? Do we take crop failures and famines like those visited upon us by 19th century El Ninos, which led to what the late great Mike Davis called late Victorian holocausts? Do we think of those as an outer bound of what's possible? Trust that our food systems will protect us against those outcomes or contemplate the possibility that they may not? So there are those, those policy questions, but we, we live in the world and contemplate the future not primarily through policy and not even really as political actors as, as often as I find myself talking about the need to address climate through politics. We do it as individuals and as individuals, we are now already beginning to live on a planet unbounded by the climatic experience of the past. We're surely better prepared 
in much of the world to endure a century scale event or a decadally brutal heat wave, in part because our forecasting actually allows us to prepare. But we won't just be getting more of those events. We'll be getting more of those 500 year storms and getting them often. We'll be getting millennium droughts and getting them more often. We'll be getting fire seasons so off the charts that scientists don't know how to incorporate them into their data sets. And perhaps so many of those seasons that eternal seeming landscapes, like the near Arctic fort far north, may be forever transformed. No longer boreal forest, but grassland, or even perhaps what scientists refer to as permanent moonscapes. What will that feel like? What does it feel like now? What does it mean? I think the only honest answer is, I don't know. And I think none of us do. So thank you. Um, maybe we can talk about the question and answer, which I think we have like 15 minutes for. happens a lot, so I'll let you get warmed up. I have a question. Yeah. I, th I think so much, of, so much of what you talked about, interestingly, is about sort of visibility and voice and the, the, the relative invisibility of, of so much of what we talk about when we talk about climate disaster, um, whether it's the amount and the volume of carbon in the atmosphere, uh, which is pollution that is you know, completely invisible to us, or what's happening around the world. Um, or even when we, you know, we, we get images of devastation in Lahaina, but you know, we don't see the people in, the, it might be really striking if we did see the people in the ocean with, with you know, um, debris, flaming debris coming at them, but we, we don't see that. Um, this is obviously a place where as a, as a literature professor, um, as a journalist, I, I think stories often function to make visible or audible or tangible something that we don't actually get to see uh, unmediated. Um, what do you see the role of a journalist in in this in this climate in this in this moment? Um, and you know maybe how do you think that the U.S. media is dealing with this? You spoke with uh, Chris Ingram's class earlier, a climate communication class, um, about the fact that the media doesn't really like you know really depressing uh, stories, and often these are really depressing stories. And, and again, they're stories about things that might not be kind of immediately or spectacularly visible in the way that, you know, some of the political violence we're seeing or, or, um, you know, even political dysfunction in Washington are sort of, sort of visible in a, in a, in a kind of immediate way. Um, how do you, you know, how do you as a journalist, uh, see, uh, how the media is doing with making those things visible or, or or audible to us? Um, thanks, yeah. Um, I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, I think if you look five years ago in the way that the American media was covering the climate crisis, um, we've come a long way. Um, I think that there are much, there's much more coverage of extreme weather. There's much more explicit linking of surprising weather patterns and um, climate events to climate change itself. It's not perfect. Not every television broadcast about every heat wave and every Flooding event mentions climate change, but there is an awful lot more of it than there used to be. That's on the day to day. And I think um, in places like the New York Times or you know other sort of prestige um, news outlets that can afford to take a longer term view, there's also more regularly dot connecting at that scale. And so I don't think it's um, any longer the case that the US media is ignoring climate change. We're not, you know, we don't have the Guardian over here, but like the, um, the truth is like people do cover it now and, and that's because readers have somewhat demanded it. But I don't know exactly what the impact that has on consciousness or the way that we think about these things. I mean, as I, I hope I hinted at, I think that there's a risk that the more that we look at these um, disasters and the more even that we may contemplate the near future, we become inert to them and, and normalize them. Um, I think that's in part, you know, one of the worries I have about my own work is that in sketching quite scary futures, I've handed a narrative to people about what is to come, that when the events actually happen, they just go, okay, just like check, I expected that, no big deal. And that it may deprive them from some of the shock and awe that these events should still hold for us. I don't wanna say that I think that that balances out the benefit of communicating and showcasing, but I think that all of these um, 
questions about how to conceptualize climate change, how to narrativize it, how to communicate, I think are incredibly complicated because the story is unbelievably complicated and large. And it, it, it's not one story, it's literally billions of stories. Um, some of them are good news, some of them, are, but it's just like they're all over the place and messy. Um, and because we are all really complicated emotional and intellectual creatures who process that information in very messy ways. And I can't even predict myself, it's like, why does one wildfire horrify me? And then the next one, I just flip the page. I don't know. Um, and I don't think we have any of us or should have any of us the confidence to predict um, how people will respond. And so that the best thing we can do as journalists is to just tell the story of the changing world as we see it changing. And that means, you know, at the level of ecosystems, it means at the level of politics, it means at the level of culture and geopolitics, um, and do what we can to take seriously the idea that this is the story of our century, the meta narrative of our time, and link as many stories that we tell back to that meta narrative as we can without feeling the need to impose any particular agenda or framework on what's happening. Um, and keep ourselves open to the possibility that the stories we told five years ago or 10 years ago may be out of date. Um, maybe we need to discard them as much as we're discarding things like heat retaining buildings in places like the mid latitudes. Um, because in part because of the decarbonization revolution, you know, the story looks different. As I said, it's, it's not true triumph, it's not clean. But um, if we are telling stories that seemed plausible five years ago about um, the world succumbing to overarching, overwhelming climate disaster, that's not really where we're headed. We're headed to some, a place much messier and weirder, and we need to take responsibility for taking action in that world, as opposed to just um, the world of perfect villains and perfect heroes that we might have thought we were living in a few years ago. We were in Kelowna uh, this past summer. A few years ago, we worked in Mozambique under circumstances and people that have nothing. Um, and we hear these stories and, you know, what's going to happen? Is there anything to hold on to? I mean, as someone concerned, we live in a community where religious people pay little attention. So where do we go for the right information? and and what do we have to cling to to answer our questions that we have? Because it seems like there's nothing but uncertainty. Well, those are, those are two somewhat different questions. I'll, I'll take the second more um, cosmic one first. Um, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that there will be many generations of humans living on this planet after we are gone. And um, I think that that's really important to keep in mind and cling to you know, to remember that the same project of um, cultural patrimony and family legacy that humans have been engaged in forever will continue. It may continue on a landscape that looks to us really degraded, and it may continue under climate conditions that impose much more climate suffering than we would like, but there will be humans living their lives and trying to navigate that future too. And the truth is, you know, um, we've already, we're already navigating a world that's quite degraded and denuded of um, natural beauty and abundance. And it's a shame, for sure. I think our, all of our lives would be richer if we were living in a, you know, untouched world. Um, but it's also the world that we're living in, navigating for ourselves, seeing as mostly normal, challenging, complicated, but still navigable for humans, navigable for moral actors. Um, and I think that all of those continuities will endure into even quite um, disruptive climate futures. Um, and the question that that raises for me is how do we orient our actions today, both at the level of politics and at the level of memory and connection in ways that make that future relatively more comfortable and more rewarding and more just and more equitable as opposed to less. And kind of to give up on the idea of beating this thing and the despair that comes from knowing that we're not going to beat it and think about what it means to be living in a different world and trying to extend all the promises that we would have wanted to extend in the absence of climate change to future generations as best as we can. Um, in terms of 
you know, information sources. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm old. I work at the New York Times. I don't have like unconventional. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I, I believe in status institutions. Um, I, they're not the only people that I listen to or read, but I, I think that the, the conventional um, establishment forces in the media are pretty good sources of climate information. Um, I think that there are a number of, you know, climate scientists also doing sort of public facing communication work that are really um, exemplary. And some of them, I, you know, I, I do a lot of, um, Carbon Brief is a, a British publication that does a lot of really good, but pretty cerebral, like weedsy scientific coverage, mostly by scientists. Um, um, I could give you a list of other folks, but, you know, in general, I don't think that reading, for instance, you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post um, is a bad place to start. Um, I think climate science is in its fundamentals um, non-contentious non and that the revisions are, um, you know, new, new findings, new papers um, are important to contemplate, but, you know, we need to incorporate them into a body of knowledge that is relatively um, stable. And one of the things that that means is that um, we don't need to be chasing, um, you know, chasing every scrap of new news. Um, we can wait for it to somewhat be incorporated into our model of the world. Maybe that's a little too slow, I don't know, um, for some people, for some tastes. But in general, I would say, you know, um, the institutions you trust for other coverage are probably pretty good about climate, and I wouldn't urge you to go racing after other sources. Um, I'd like to ask about what I perceive is there's no place in American society to talk about the liberty to add CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, I've been a climate aware person for about seven years and I've been trying to be conscientious and reduce my CO2 footprint to a level which is commensurate with what the IPCC is recommending. Um, and I've been trying to maintain a lifestyle and as I talk to other people about it, I've found myself ostracized, um, largely in American society, um, trying to date women who are college educated as I am. Um, if I refuse to travel by jet, um, I get the thumbs down. Um, I have since found someone who <laughs> is okay with that. Um, but the American carbon footprint is roughly an order of magnitude greater than what the scientists are recommending. And I'd like to ask you, like you, you probably took a ton of CO2 to fly from coast to coast to participate in a talk like this. How you reconcile your personal carbon footprint with the, with the message that you're sending? And how do we begin to have the conversation? And where should the place be to talk about the liberty that we have? Because right now, there's nobody that has jurisdiction. There's no governmental entity that governs how much CO2 we can add. As American citizens, we need to ask our government to participate in a global agreement to do so, and we don't want to because we don't want to know what our carbon footprint is personally. We don't want to deal with the shame of that. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there are a lot of different pieces of that question that are worth talking through. Um, you know, just to pick up on the last point first, I sometimes worry that the problem isn't shame. The problem is that too few of us feel shame. Um, and, I, you know, one of the uglier thoughts that I have about the climate crisis is that the, the way that it maps onto global inequalities um, is not something that we're turning a blind eye to as rich people. It's something that we're actually kind of comforted by as rich people to know that other people are going to be suffering more than us. Um, so I don't know exactly that, you know, knowledge about um, guilt for the climate crisis is sufficient to turn many Americans who want to consume rapaciously from that set of commitments or um, behavior patterns. Um, and it's absolutely true, as you say, the U.S. carbon footprint is, you know, enormously large on a per capita basis. It's actually smaller than Canada's in some oil producing states, but, you know, it's, it's monstrously large and maybe most dramatically, you know, putting aside what the IPCC says we should and putting aside the really unflattering comparisons to people in the global south where like the average American refrigerator produces more carbon than the average person in Nigeria, which isn't even a poor country in Africa. Um, it's a middle income country. Um, but putting aside those comparisons, 
you know, our per, car per capita carbon footprint is like twice the EU average. So if you think like, well, I don't want to give up all my, all my, uh, my abundant quality of life. It's like, what we're talking about is like, you know, in theory, um, efforts to reduce our footprint only to the average person, person living in like Switzerland. Um, but having said that, my own view starts from the global project, which is that to stall warming, we need to get to net zero. We can't just reduce emissions. We got to eliminate them. If we don't eliminate them, the heating is going to continue. I also think that that's going to happen. It may not happen by 2050, which is what scientists are asking us to do and the IPCC is asking us to do. In fact, I don't think it will. Um, it may not even happen by 2070 or 2080, but by 2100, 2120, um, I think we're gonna be in a world where we are at net zero, which means that we have stopped producing additional carbon. And in a net zero world, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter if we take flights. It doesn't matter if we drive huge cars. It doesn't matter how we consume food, because all of it has no carbon footprint. There are other ecological questions to ask about that, those patterns, but from a climate perspective, if we get to net zero, then we don't need to worry about carbon footprints. And so my own view is that the most important goal and job is to mobilize to the extent that we can to accelerate that transition to net zero. And that means mostly political action because if everyone in this room, if everyone in the United States stopped eating red meat, stopped flying, bought an electric car, it still wouldn't make that much of a difference. It's a planet of 8 billion people. And you know the idea that we could be doing this entirely through willful individual action, I think is um, it has important spillover effects. It gets people on board. It makes them aware, maybe pulls them towards political action. But if we really want to get all the way to net zero, we need to redesign almost all of these systems pretty fundamentally to take carbon out of the equation. And that requires something more than changes in one's individual life. Now, I think people should take action in their own lives. I think it's important to feel like you're living within your values. And I think, again, it's a great advertisement for those around you that you care about these things. You've bumped into the opposite problem where people are turned off by that commitment. In my experience, um, and the experience of most people I know, the more that you talk about it, the more people are willing to talk about it. But, um, and, and many more people carry around private climate anxiety than ever really talk about it with the people around them. Um, so I think all of this is sort of useful at a communications level, which is sort of the first step of political action. And I wouldn't want to discourage people from taking action in their own lives as you have. But I also think it's important to keep in mind that the big picture is systems change. And if we don't achieve really meaningful systems change, if we don't actually take oil and gas and coal off the electricity grid, if we don't actually reform the way that our planes are powered, if we don't actually change the way that we grow our food, if we don't do those really large scale things at the global level, we're not gonna stop warming. I think keeping that goal in mind is helpful in thinking about one's own responsibility. And fundamentally, ultimately, I think, for somewhat absolving the feelings of guilt and hypocrisy that many of us have for participating in the contemporary world, which is to say, we wanna change this world, but we can't wait for it to change. We need to change it. Um, and you know that means for someone like me, maybe for some other people in this room, that does mean some air travel. It does mean you know um, other kinds of you know activity that isn't perfectly carbon neutral. Um, that is to some extent a form of hypocrisy. But for me, hypocrisy also describes what I think of as political ambition. It's when we want to be better together than we are as individuals. That's what politics is for, and. You know, I, th I think that it offers a kind of a, a path out of um, the some, sometimes claustrophobic feelings of carbon responsibility mm -hmm. and the matter of carbon footprints to think that the job that we're doing together is more important than the job that we're doing as individuals. Can I ask a quick follow-up? I think we're unfortunately out of time. Bef um, thank you, though. <laughs> we are unfortunately out of time. Um, before you join me in thanking David Wallace Wells, I just want to let you know um, the King's English Bookstore is here. Uh, Rob's in the back selling David's books. Maybe you could sign up. Yeah. I think David will be willing to sign a couple. Which and is also if you have time and you want to ask a couple <laughs> questions, I can be back there. That, that's terrific. Signing. He's been very generous with his time here. Um, please join me in thanking David Wallace Wells. Thank you.